Music. We all know what it is, and I dare say that most of us at least enjoy one genre. Music carries a unique ability to connect populations and convey emotions. However, music's greatest power may remain unrecognized and unharnessed. College students listening to music while studying or doing work is commonplace, but is there a scientific advantage to doing so? Let's take a look at whether music affects cognitive ability, especially as used by students. While the question of the link between music and intelligence certainly has been asked for generations, the topic hit mainstream U.S. media when Rosner's so-called Mozart effect was published. Using 36 undergraduate students, Rosner came up with the conclusion that the ever-changing, complex nature of classical Mozart provided observable mental stimulus to students. No other forms of music were thoroughly tested as he expected that this Mozart had a unique effect. His work was published in 1993 through Nature, an academic and scientific journal. By 1998, the governor of Georgia was asking that every newborn's parents receive a Mozart tape with their care package. Fast forward a decade and the closed-mindedness of the Mozart effect is called out by Schellenberg's studies. In his 2005 publication, Schellenberg replicates Roger's use of the undergraduate students but broadens music types used. Through tests, he concludes that major keyed music, recognizable to non-musicians as having a happy sound, has the best effect on cognitive abilities, but the effect slowly wears off after just 15 minutes. Schellenberg also suggests that long-term musicians performed better to music stimulus. This claim is supported by Hetland. In 2012, psychologists at the Carford Metropolitan University made ways by completely disproving the Mozart effect by presenting data that supports musical preference having a much larger effect on music's effect on mental performance than genre or composition. They also explored the effect of tempo. Data shows that fast, liked music is the best to listen to in order to boost mental ability. The use of top 40 pop songs as common liked tunes challenges Rosher's original theory. Here in this chart, adapted directly from the article, the relationship between preference and tempo is clear, where liked music is labeled as the darker bars. So now that we've realized that music helps cognitive ability, how do we move forward? The logical thing to do would be to maximize music and schooling and take advantage of music's full potential. After all, Schellenberg and Hetland both saw that long-term students of music saw the best benefits from music. But now more than ever, music in public schools is being pushed aside for STEM funding and standardized testing. And I question that many high school or college instructors would even allow headphones during tests. Collel and Davidson, in an article directed towards middle school administrators, point to the advantages of using music to create connections between different disciplines. They suggest taking steps such as linking music to other classes and not classifying music as merely a fine art. As an example of how music relates to other studies, a musician's study of harmonics and an engineer's lecture on standing waves stems from the same natural event, the same science, and are simply studied from different angles. So, to wrap things up, music has a proven effect on mental tasks such as desk work or studying. If you're a musician, listening to music while you do these will help you perform even better. Don't force yourself to listen to 250 year old music. Play what you like. Choose something upbeat too. Lastly, now that we understand that music has a positive effect on how we perform mentally, let's use music to its fullest educational potential.